Welcome back. We'll be now starting with the second part of our course on statistics for experimentalists. In this lecture, we'll be looking at a relatively simple situation. Here, experiments are carried out by changing only one variable or only one factor. Usually, experimentalists vary more than two factors. A simple example would be we are interested in uh, looking at the yield or conversion from a chemical reaction. So, we may vary temperature and pressure or temperature pressure flow rate of the reactants, temperature pressure flow rate and catalyst involved and so on. For the purpose of illustrating the basic concepts, we are going to consider the variation of a single factor only. The other factors are assumed to be kept at fixed values or at constant values, they are not being changed. The reference for this lecture is the book written by Montgomery and Runger, Applied Statistics and Probability for Engineers, 5th edition, Wiley, India. Let us look at the terminologies first. The factor is a controlled variable whose effect on the outcome is being investigated. Level is the value that is assigned to the factor and many levels of the same factor may be tested. We want to study the effect of temperature on the yield in a chemical reaction. So, the factor is temperature we want to vary this factor to see the effect of this factor on the yield. The levels of this factor can be different temperatures, 30 degrees centigrade, 50 degrees centigrade, 100 degrees centigrade and so on. So, we can have several levels of the same factor. Now, we are looking at uh, another important term, treatment. It is somewhat uh, very uh, unusual term in experiments, uh, sometimes we encounter it, so better to define it. It is very simple in fact, treatment is each level or setting for a factor. So, it is the value taken by a factor when it is kept at a certain level we can have A treatments for our reactor example, there may be A temperatures. Many times we are not satisfied with uh, doing the experiment only once. If we want to study the effect of temperature on the yield, we study various temperatures like 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 50 degrees and 100 degrees and so on. But we have considered each level of the factor only once. That is not what I meant. We want to repeat the experiment at the same treatment or level of a given factor and uh, see the effect of the repetition on the reproducibility of the response. We want to carry out the experiment at the same temperature, let us say 50 degrees centigrade and see what is the yield when we repeat it several times. Repeats also are intuitively appealing to us because if we get more or less the same response from the uh, experiment, whenever we repeat them at a given uh, setting, then we are convinced that we have done the experiments properly, the equipment or the reactor is working properly and we are having confidence in our results. So, repeats are very important from a statistical point of view also, repetition of experiments is very essential. When there are A treatments and N repeats, we will have a total of A into N experiments. The next term which we are going to define is the response 
the outcome of the experiment for each treatment what is the output from the reactor what is the yield from the reactor what do we get so that is what we are calling as the response and since there are several random factors that may influence the outcome of this experiment the response is treated as a random variable normally we denote the response as y we are going to concentrate on only one factor the reason for this is we want to establish the basic groundwork uh, introduce you to the concept of variance degrees of freedom the uh, mean squares the analysis of variance f test and the conclusion you make after looking at the f statistic this also involves hypothesis testing anyway we will uh, cross the bridge when we come to that and uh, so let us get on with this introduction the effect of changing the levels of one factor on the desired response is investigated so we are looking at the effect of different treatments there may be many settings or treatments of this factor as well as many replicates or repeats for each treatment why does the uh, experiment give different results even if we take all the precautions like uh, keeping the factor level at pretty much a given value all other factors or all other variables that may influence the experiment are well controlled we are not varying them we are making sure that uh, the uh, ambient conditions are not varying too much still we may get uh, variation in the response these are attributable to random errors when we repeat the experiments we get variability in our response and that may be attributed to the random factors or random phenomena so in order to get an idea about the experimental error uh, we need repeats or replicates whenever we talk about experimental error we are not accusing the experimentalist of doing the experiments in a bad fashion despite his best efforts to maintain proper conditions there may be variation in the response so we talk in a neutral sense whenever we refer to the experimental error in the data when the level of a factor is changed there is going to be a variation in the response hence we think that because of the change in the level of the factor because of applying a new treatment there is a variation produced so let us look at crops being grown in a field and we want to test different fertilizers so in plot 1 we uh, put fertilizer a we look at the uh, yield then we apply fertilizer b that is a new treatment and we look at the yield if there is a change in the yield a difference in the yield we think that it is because of the change in the treatment or change in the level of the factor there was a difference in the crop output so this is what we normally think we do not think that there could have been other factors which may have caused a difference in the yield but the farmer or the uh, person who is doing this investigation may firmly state look i only varied the uh, fertilizer the type of the soil the amount of watering the length of watering all other factors were unchanged only the factor that changed was the type of fertilizer okay even then we have to be uh, careful we have to see whether the variation in the crop production the variation in the reactor yield the variation in the response generally was due to changing the treatment or changing the level of a factor or it was because of random effects random effects which were not in our control 
affected the experiment strongly or in whatever manner and produced a variation in the response. So, the extent of this response change may be different. Sometimes there may be a small change in the response, sometimes there may be a large change in the response. If there is a large change in the response of the experiment, then we think that it is because of the uh, treatment change. Sometimes there may be only a medium or small response change when you change the level of the factor or change the treatment. Then you do not know whether the response changed because of changing the treatment or it was because of random effects. So, we need to quantify this so that the results may be presented in a unambiguous fashion. So, we are going to look at uh, variance. Whenever we do repeats of experiments, we look at the mean outcome or the mean yield or the mean crop production. But it is not only mean which is important. In addition to mean or average, we also have to look at the variance. So, again whatever we studied in the first part of the course is becoming very relevant now. The variance is a very, very important uh, factor. Let me not use the word factor because we are already using it for looking at uh, the uh, variable. Variance can create an important influence on the interpretation of the data. So, let us see how this happens. What we are doing is we are going to compare the variation due to change in treatments with variation due to repeats. As I said earlier, repeats are representatives of the random phenomena. Whenever we repeat the experiments, we may get different results and hence that variation is representative of the experimental errors that influence the process on which the experimenter usually has no control on. But of course, he can change the level of the uh, factor. He can go from fertilizer A to fertilizer B or he can go from 30 degrees centigrade to 50 degrees centigrade. So, he has control over the variable or factor he is actually changing and he can maintain them at the constant value. So, we are having change in treatment and also we are having random errors we have to compare the two and we have to compare the variability produced by the random error with the variability produced by the change in treatments. So, we have to compare the variation between treatments to variation within treatments. Let us look at uh, table of experimental data collection. So, we are having the A treatments in this column, we are going from 1, 2, so on to A. And for the first treatment, we have carried out n repeats. So, you can see that you are going from y11, y12, so on to y1n. 1 standing for the first treatment and 1, 2, 3, so on to n standing for the repeats. So, we are denoting the experimental outcome as y i j. The response is given as y i j, where i stands for the treatment and j stands for the repeat. i is the index for the treatment and j is the index for the repeat. So, the treatments are varying rho wise. So, i is running from 1, 2, so on to a, whereas j is running from 1, 2, so on to n. So, totally we have A into N runs. So, all these uh, runs are uh, recorded as responses and we have totally A N elements. Now, we can total them and uh, for a given treatment, we add all the responses due to the repeats, N repeats and we get Y 1 dot. So, we are fixing 1 which is the treatment and dot represents the summation. So, it is instead of writing sigma j is equal to 1 to n y 1 comma j we are writing it as y 1 dot. 
and when you take the average, when you add up the responses for a given treatment, n responses for a given treatment, you get y1 dot. That you divide by the number of repeats, that will be y1 dot by n, which is the average response for a given treatment 1. That is represented by y bar 1 dot the bar represents the averaging. Similarly, you can do for the second treatment, you can do for the eighth treatment. So, you will get y 1 dot, y 2 dot, so on to y a dot and uh, the averages may also be denoted by y bar 1 dot, y bar 2 dot, so on to y bar a dot. And similarly, just as you did row wise, the totaling and averaging, you may also do the uh, totaling column wise. Normally, the row wise totals and averages would be used. So, what I have done here is to uh, denote the uh, totals. So, you have y 1 dot when you go row wise for the second treatment, when you add all the n treatments you get y 2 dot because treatment 2 is fixed and so you get all these uh, responses put in the appropriate terminology. Again I can uh, sum up the values for the first repeat. So, there I am summing over all the treatments for the first repeat. So, I write it as y dot 1. Similarly, for the uh, nth repeat for each treatment, I am totaling the responses over all the treatments for the nth repeat. So, I get y dot n. And when you add all these responses you get the grand total y dot dot and when you divide it by total number of observations which is a into n number of treatments into number of repeats y dot dot by a into n gives y bar dot dot which is the global average or the grand average. So, the same thing I have put in this table and I have shown the averages. So, when I am considering the first repeat and I am adding all the responses over the a treatments, I get y dot 1. When I am averaging it out by dividing it by total number of treatments, I get y bar dot 1. So, I am adding all these elements, I will get y dot 1, y dot 1 divided by a will give me y dot 1 bar or more correctly y bar dot 1. Similarly, I can do the averaging for the other columns and the global average is y bar dot dot. So, this is the uh, terminology which I was explaining a couple of slides back. You are adding over the index j running from 1 to n. So, i is kept constant. So, you put y i dot. Similarly, Here I am uh, taking the same summation either this or this and that I am dividing it by the total number of repeats n and I get y bar i dot. Obviously, i is running from 1 to a I am fixing i in this case and j is running from 1 to n j represents the repeats and i represents the treatments. And when I add up all the responses over all the treatments and uh, all the uh, means, I get y i j is equal to y dot dot. There is a typo here, I will correct the typo. Okay, thanks for waiting. Uh, the terminology is uh, you should put the uh, i index first and the j index next. So, i running from 1 to a and j running from 1 to n, y i j is equal to y dot dot. Similarly, I am uh, finding the mean, the grand mean. So, the grand total is divided by the total number of observations a into n, I will get 
y bar dot dot. This is usually found in these uh, statistical design of experiments textbooks. So, it is important that we become comfortable and uh, familiar uh, with the terminology the dot notation. So, n is the product of the a treatments and the number of repeats per treatment the dot represents the summation over the index it replaces. So, when we put y i dot it is replacing the summation over j. Now, let us look at the experimental response we want to model that we are not going to do any complicated uh, modeling it is a simple linear model, but it carries a lot of punch as we will see y i j which is the response from the ith treatment and the jth repeat is modeled as a sum of three terms. The first is the global average mu, then tau i is the effect of the ith treatment and epsilon ij is the random error. Interesting to see the different symbols mu is having no subscript because it is standing for the global uh, average or the uh, mean response and tau i is the ith treatment effect and it is having the index i corresponding to the treatment and epsilon ij is having the indices corresponding to both treatment as well as the repeats. We may write mu plus tau i as mu i. So, y i j is equal to mu i plus epsilon i j. This is a simple linear model. We have not uh, put a nonlinear model here, for example, uh, y i j is equal to mu sin tau i to the power of epsilon i j. Some uh, highly complicated uh, uh, model which we will find it very difficult to work with. We are having only a simple linear model and we are talking about the effect of only one factor. So, we are having tau i which is the uh, representation of the single factor we are analyzing. So, tau probably stands for temperature or fertilizer. This tau can have different uh, levels temperatures can take different values 30, 50, 80, 100 degree centigrade fertilizer can take fertilizer A, fertilizer B, fertilizer C and so on. So, we are having only one factor. So, we put only one tau i if you are considering two factors this linear model is simply extended we can put tau i plus beta j and epsilon i j k because we are having now a combination of two factors i and j and then k will become the uh, index for representing the repeats. We will be seeing these uh, two factors shortly even more factors. So, we do not have to really worry about it let us focus on a single factor now. Essentially mu would be the response y i j every time when the factor is not having an effect and there is no random fluctuations. We will get a unique value in our experiment or from our experiment when the treatments are not effective and random errors are not there. The next possibility is random errors are there, but the treatment effects are not there. Then what would happen is this value of mu will get spread because of the effect of the random fa uh, random factors or uh, random effects. The other possibility is both of them will be if present the treatment is having an effect the error is having an effect. So, we are now considering the variability given to a global response mu because of 
the treatment as well as the random noise or random errors. If there is an effect of treatment on mu, the mu is changing because of the treatment, then it takes a unique value mu i corresponding to the ith treatment. Remember, we can give A levels of the treatment. So, depending on what treatment you have given, the mu has changed and that will become mu i. A very interesting figure awaits us. Here, you are having mu i and mu j. This is the uh, response spread because of the application of first treatment or the ith treatment. This is the response obtained because of the application of the jth treatment. The middle value of this is mu i and that is defined as mu plus tau i. If tau i is 0, then mu i becomes mu. If tau j is 0, there is no effect of the j treatment, mu j becomes mu. So, in both these places you will have mu and mu, but if tau i is effective, mu i will be different from mu j. And very interesting thing is all these spread is because of the variance sigma squared. We assume that this variance is because of this random effects, okay, the random fluctuating components which are not in our control and the variance of the errors are constant. Okay. The errors are assumed to have 0 mean and have constant variance. So, the net sum of all these errors on the response would be to produce a spread around mu i around mu j with the variance constant variance sigma squared. I request you to take a closer look at this figure and make sure that you have understood the concepts. Still in the process of modeling the experimental response, we have the mu which is the overall mean and it is a parameter common to all the treatments. This would be the response which we will be getting if there was no effect of the treatments and there was no random error fluctuations. Every time we do the experiment whether we put fertilizer A, fertilizer B or fertilizer C, every time the field produces uh, 1 ton per annum of the rice grains or the reactor is producing exactly 30 percent yield irrespective of whether you put the temperature at 30 degrees centigrade or whether you are putting the temperature at 100 degrees centigrade. So, that is the common uniform value if none of the treatments and the random fluctuations are influencing the process okay. and this is obviously not going to happen. Mu i is defined as the ith treatment mean. What is the mean response for the ith treatment? When I am operating the reactor at 30 degrees centigrade, what is the percentage yield? That is modeled as the addition to the mean mu which is corresponding to the unique value unaffected by the treatment and unaffected by the random error. So, we are assuming that there is an addition to it, addition to the mu. Of course, there may be some cases where uh, the effect of the treatment tau j for instance may actually reduce the value of mu such that mu j may be mu minus tau j, but in general we represent mu i or mu j as mu plus tau i or mu plus tau j. What I am trying to say here is tau i may be positive or negative. So, we are having tau i we call it as the effect of the ith treatment and epsilon i j is the random error contribution which is normally distributed with 0 mean and variance sigma squared. We are having this nomenclature to represent the 
normal distribution with 0 mean and variance sigma squared. Now, we are coming to the null and alternate hypothesis statements which we studied very recently. We can now see the uh, topics we studied in the first part of the course for example, the normal distribution, the uh, hypothesis testing all are nicely falling in place in the design of experiments. So, we can have the null hypothesis as mu 1 is equal to mu 2 is equal to so on to equal to mu a equals mu. What is the meaning of this statement? All the responses are equal to mu whether I am applying the first treatment or the second treatment or the third treatment first temperature second temperature or the third temperature the output is not changing there is no change there is a status quo okay there is no effect of the treatment there is no effect of the treatment whether I have put 30 degree centigrade or 80 degree centigrade in the reactor the yield is not changing. So, that is a skeptical view that is a neutral view and so we say that uh, we say that the null hypothesis indicates that there is no effect of treatment it is a safe view. Now, the alternate hypothesis is going to be uh, in uh, opposition with the null hypothesis. The alternate hypothesis is trying to revolt against the current status quo and say that uh, there is a change ok there will be a change upon application of the treatment. So, the alternate hypothesis is always uh, supporting or rooting for the change. It says there may be many treatments and of course, I agree that there may be some treatments which are not effective, but there is at least one pair of means mu i and mu j which are not equal. If at least one mu i is not equal to another mu j, then there is at least one treatment which is effective and different from the others. So, at least one of the tau i values is not equal to 0 just going back if all the tau i values are 0 then what will happen mu i will become equal to mu mu i is equal to mu plus tau i i running from 1 2 3 so on to a treatments. So, when tau i is 0 then none of the treatments are producing a change from the global response ok that is the view taken by the null hypothesis, but the alternate hypothesis says among A treatments running from 1 to so on to A there is at least one treatment which is producing an effect that is different from all other treatments. The in this case all other treatments are producing no effect and there is only one treatment which is producing an effect. So, the number of treatments which are actually producing effects may be uh, different there may be one treatment which may be uh, different from all others or all the treatments may be different from each other and hence all the mu i's may be different from each other and from the global value mu. So, you are essentially having y i j which is the response and it is a combination of the treatment effect plus the random fluctuation effect. If you go back to the graph I like this graph very much if there was no noise what would have happened is we would have got two values unique values mu i and mu j it would have been a straight line ok a direct delta impulse ok. So, that means that you have got a unique value mu i and mu j which are different from each other. However, 
the values are spread about mu i and mu j because of random factors the random error components with variance sigma squared and so that causes a spread in these deviations. The extent of the spread is the same in both these uh, cases. What I am trying to say is both mu i and mu j are spread in an identical fashion. Only thing is the center of this distribution is mu i and the center of the next distribution is mu j. However, the spread is the same in both these cases because the error is assumed to be normally distributed with the 0 mean and variance sigma squared. And of course, then these are also normal distributions. So, when this error distribution is superimposed on each and every one of the treatment means, we get A normal distributions which are having a mean value or spread around mu i, i running from 1 to so on to A and constant variance sigma squared. This A is not we get a normal distribution, we get A normal distributions. So, we have to resolve the total sum of squares. Okay, how to get the total sum of squares I will tell in a moment. We resolve the total sum of squares into error sum of squares and treatment sum of squares. Okay, whenever we uh, found the variance, what did we do? We found the mean first and then we subtracted uh, from each of the number the average or the mean value, then we squared it. So, we had square of the deviations and then we divided the square of the deviations by n minus 1, where n is the number of data points. This gave us the variance, exactly the same concept we are going to apply here, but we are going to have different types of sum of squares and that will become obvious in a moment. So, we are essentially looking at error sum of squares and treatment sum of squares. The total sum of squares represents the deviation from each and every experimental response from the global average value y dot dot bar or more correctly y bar dot dot. y bar dot dot is nothing but the global average. So, each and every experimental observation is uh, subtracted by the uh, global average and these deviations are squared. Obviously, if we do not square them and we sum all these deviations, they will become 0. But when we square them, all the negative deviations as well as the positive deviations will now be only greater than 0 and hence their sum will not be equal to 0 usually. Okay. Miraculously, if all the observations are exactly matching with the uh, mean value, then the sum of squares will be 0, but that is very, very unlikely. So, anyway to emphasize my point, i is equal to 1 to a, j is equal to 1 to n, i index standing for treatment, we are having a treatments, j index standing for repeats, we are having uh, n repeats and we take the square of the deviations, we get total sum of squares. Very interesting uh, mathematical manipulations are possible, unfortunately time does not permit us to get into all these uh, nice uh, uh, derivations. For some people, these derivations may look very complex, uh, but uh, it is very nice. Okay. Uh, it is a pity that there is not enough time to get into all these mathematical derivations, uh, which will uh, bring out the uh, elegance and beauty of uh, statistics in their full glory. But uh, we will uh, take the main results and move on i is equal to 1 to a, j is equal to 1 to n, y i j minus y bar dot dot whole squared may be split into two components. That is 
n into i equals 1 to a y bar i dot minus y bar dot dot whole squared plus again the double summation running from i equals 1 to a j equals 1 to n y i j minus y bar i dot whole squared. Before we go next, you please try to look at this equation and see what they are actually representing. If I do not get distracted by n and all these summations, this y bar i dot will cancel out with y bar i dot and so you are essentially having uh, y i j minus, uh, so this is cancelling out, so I am getting y i j minus y bar dot dot which is equal to this one. You may argue that this linear uh, combination is not uh, possible because you are squaring the terms. Okay. Uh, if I had not put the double summation and I had not multiplied by n, then I can write y i j minus y dot dot okay, y bar dot dot in terms of adding and subtracting the uh, y bar i dot to y i j minus y bar dot dot. Anyway, so you get the point I think. Uh, there is also another interesting interpretation to this. If you know Pythagoras uh, theorem or remember it of course, then the sum of the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides of the right hand uh, right angled uh, triangle. So, the same concept is uh, being applied uh, here the sum of the squares may be resolved into two components one due to the treatments and another due to the error. So, if you look at this closely let me see you are saying the same thing total sum of squares is sum of squares due to treatments and sum of squares due to error. Here y i j minus y bar dot dot represents the deviation of the individual observation from the global mean. This is the representation of the treatment mean from the global average. This is the deviation of the individual observation from the treatment mean. So, we are doing repeats for each treatment we have done n repeats for each treatment we have averaged the n repeats we get y bar i dot that is the treatment mean we are comparing the treatment mean with the global average. So, this is the contribution from treatment sum of squares here we are considering the uh, global average sorry we are not considering the global average here we are considering the individual response with the uh, treatment mean. Okay. So, what, what we are doing or how we are doing rather is for a given treatment we are comparing the individual response for that treatment with the uh, treatment average. If the error contribution was negligible or not present whenever we repeated the experiments we would have got the same response y i j in which case the y i j would have been same as y i y bar i dot okay, they would have been the same, but each repeat for a given treatment itself is producing some variation and that is how the error contribution comes in. Okay. So, we are modeling the error contribution by this sum of squares. So, with that out of the way we can now compare the uh, treatments contribution with the error contributions and if the error contributions and the uh, treatment contributions are comparable then we can say that the treatments are not really having any effect. So, rather than looking at the total sum of squares and uh, comparing the treatment sum of squares and error sum of squares 
we have to normalize the sum of squares for each term because each term in the uh, sum of squares equation have has different degrees of freedom. Let us now look at the degrees of freedom. Here you are having A into N observations, but not all of them are independent. Of course, all of them are important, but uh, not all of them are uh, independent in the sense Y i j minus Y bar dot dot if I am adding the sum of the deviations from the mean will be equal to 0. So, if I am calculating the global mean from the responses, then I need to know only n minus 1 or sorry a n minus 1 y i j values. So, knowing a n minus 1 y i j values and the global average, I can find out what is the remaining value. So, we have totally a n minus 1 degrees of freedom. The same argument we can uh, apply to the uh, error sum of squares. Here, forget about the treatment for the time being. Let us say we are having a particular treatment and we have found the treatment average based on the n repeats. So, there are only n minus 1 independent entities and so you have n minus 1 and then you are having a treatments. So, the degrees of freedom would be a into n minus 1. It is saying that there are a into n minus 1 independent entities in this expression. So, this is also out of the way and uh, since all the treatment means when averaged uh, will give you the global average, there are only uh, a minus 1 uh, independent treatment means. So, either you can argue on those lines or you can subtract the degrees of freedom for this expression with the degrees of freedom for this expression and you will get uh, a minus 1. So, let us see whether it happens like that. The degrees of freedom for the treatment sum of squares just now we saw is a minus 1. So, we have to now find the mean square treatments and the mean square error. The simple thing is the treatment sum of squares are divided by the treatment uh, degrees of freedom the error sum of squares are divided by the error degrees of freedom that is it. We get the mean square treatment and mean square error. Sum of squares of the treatments divided by a minus 1, sum of squares of the error divided by a into n minus 1. The expected values are pretty interesting. The expected value of the mean square treatments is sigma squared plus this contribution because of the treatments. The expected mean square for the error is simply sigma squared. Again, I am not looking at the mathematical derivations, it is quite straightforward. You are having this. If the treatments were uh, ineffective, the tau i squared will all become 0 or close to 0, and we have uh, sigma squared again. So, the uh, variance in the mean square treatments becomes comparable to the variance with the error. So, since the uh, expected value of the mean square error gives the error variance sigma squared, we can say that the expected mean square error is an unbiased estimator of sigma squared. The mean square treatments also will become an uh, unbiased estimator if the null hypothesis were true. That means, all the other uh, treatment effects were negligible. All the treatment effects in fact were negligible and so you get expected mean square treatments is equal to sigma squared. Then if the null hypothesis were not true, the expected mean square treatments will exceed the expected mean square. Obviously, the effects due to the treatments will start kicking in and so this expected mean square treatments will be different from the expected mean square error. So, what we do is here we are uh, looking at uh, two statistics and uh, what we do here is do a f test. I request you to uh, again look at the scope of the uh, f test what we were doing 
and uh, here we are looking at mean square treatments by mean square error ratio that we relate it to F naught. We are essentially looking at the ratios of two variances which is precisely what the F test was doing. The mean square treatments and mean square error will be comparable if the treatments are not having an effect, but the mean square treatments would be higher than mean square error if at least one of the treatments or more of them are uh, making a significant contribution. So, we have to see whether they are really significant. So, we can set up the analysis of variance table where we list down the treatments error and total. So, we have sum of squares due to treatments, sum of square due to error and total sum of squares. The degrees of freedom are a minus 1, a into n minus 1, a n minus 1 is the total degrees of freedom. When we divide the sum of squares by the respective degrees of freedom, we get the mean square treatments and mean square error. Then we take the ratio of these two to find F naught. So, we conclude at this point and uh, we will continue in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.